right, everybody, I feel like we'll get started. So first up, hi, I'm Brandon Son. I'm a PhD graduate from the University of Colorado, Denver. And our team of presenters today are part of the writing group uh, representing the Society of Academic Emergency LGBTQIA plus task force of the Academ Academy of Diversity, Inclusion, and Medicine. Uh, and this presentation is a representative sampling of two manuscripts our group published over the last year with the intent of improving provider understanding of LGBTQIA plus identities and ultimately improving patient care. Emergency physicians need to recognize the diversity of identities held by sexual and gender minorities as well as the health implications and inequities experienced by these communities. Identities such as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, intersex, asexual, aromatic, and many others fall under the LGBTQIA acronym. This wide spectrum is seldom discussed in emergency medicine, but nonetheless impacts both patient care and patient experience in acute and critical care settings. These individuals may therefore frequently fail to access needed care and in general have worse health outcomes. Additionally, while many physicians understand the numerous nuances of the LGBTQIA plus acronym, there is likely a large variation in depth of knowledge complicated by a vernacular that is always shifting. This commentary will provide a brief but non-exhaustive review of LGBTQIA plus identities and supply a critical framework for applying this understanding to patient encounters in the emergency department. Uh, as I mentioned, this work is the culmination of the efforts of a dedicated group of individuals pictured here representing the SAM, ADIM, LGBTQIA plus task force. <laughs> and if that wasn't enough acronyms, uh, I don't know what else to provide you. Uh, and with that, I, uh, Dr. Ritchie will now introduce some of the basic concepts critical to understanding. Good morning, everyone. My name is Amanda Ritchie, and my pronouns are she, her, and I am from LSU here in New Orleans. So I just want to go through some basic concepts here with you guys. But first, a quick poll question. These questions that we have scattered throughout our presentation are not actually for you to answer. They're just something for you to think about, kind of answer in your head, and then we'll answer them as we go through. So gender identity is A, the same thing as sexual orientation, B, not important, or C, the innermost concept of self and how the individual perceives themselves. I think we can all pretty well figure out the answer to this one. It's definitely not B. All right, basic concepts. So biological sex is one of the core tenets, right? So this is either genetic gender or genotype. So you have your male, XY, female, XX, and then you have other variants, such as XO, multiple Xs, multiple Ys. At birth, most infants are born with obvious external genitalia. However, sometimes, you know, it can still be a little bit ambiguous. If assigned uh, based on chromosomes, the terminology to describe biological sex and its gender counterpart with, export, uh, with corresponding pronouns is up there on the board. So assigned female at birth, or AFAB, or assigned male at birth, AMAB. Sexual orientation and gender identity are completely two different concepts, all right? The Human Rights Campaign describes each concept individually. Sexual orientation is an inherent or immutable, enduring, emotional, romantic, or sexual attraction to other people independent of gender identity. And then gender identity is one's innermost concept of self as male, female, of blend of both or neither, how individuals perceive themselves and what they call themselves. So the basis of this entire talk is pretty much that our language matters. Our cultural roles and norms contribute to gender-specific social expectations, which can impact health and disease processes. LGBTQIA terminology is derived from the nuanced history of the LGBTQIA community. Some of the vernacular that was formerly used in a disparaging way is being reclaimed by the community, which is so important to this community's identity. However, much of the terminology remains offensive and should never be used. And understanding the little nuances and which term can be used and which can't be is really important that we can help make our patients feel comfortable whenever we're taking care of them. Heteronormative is another kind of term we want to go through. It's the perception that most persons have congruent biological sex, gender identity, and attraction to the opposite gender. 
So humans can have every imaginable variation and configuration of chromosomes, genitalia, gender identities, mm -hmm. sexual attractions, and sexual behaviors. Terms and definitions are constantly adapting and changing, especially in the non-heteronormative world, and vary by local culture. So gender non-conforming is an umbrella term for those whose gender expression doesn't conform to traditional gender norms. Non-binary can also be used for those whose gender identity fails, uh, falls outside of the binary man-woman uh, norm. So that is the end of my quick intro section, and I will pass this along. All right, good morning, and thanks for being here so early with us. Uh, I'm Dan Egan from uh, Mass General in Boston, and I use he, him, his pronouns. And um, I don't have a terribly complicated part of this talk, hopefully, to most people in the room, which is just to go through the first couple of letters in this acronym here. Um, so this is our kind of umbrella, all-inclusive acronym, and the plus really indicates the large, sort of growing um, number of individuals who are sort of aligning and, and uh, falling under this umbrella term. Um, so I think most people have a sense of what it means to be a lesbian, but just to explicitly state that, um, a lesbian is a person who identifies as a woman and who is sexually or romantically attracted to other women. Um, this can include people who are assigned male at birth, but whose gender identity is a woman. And that's an important thing um, to recognize that gender identity um, and sexual orientation are different things and don't um, necessarily follow um, one specific uh, group of uh, in this acronym. G is for gay, which initially was the word used to describe gender identity men who are sexually or romantically attracted to other men. More recently, that term has become a little bit more encompassing um, and really is used by many individuals in the LGBTQIA plus community to really just describe individuals who do not conform necessarily to the heteronormative um, culture as described previously. So this traditionally, like I said, is men or uh, assigned female at birth who identify as a man who are attracted to other men, but can include women who are attracted to women and other um, members of the group, including non-binary individuals. Bisexual individuals are those who are attracted to others regardless of gender. Um, and this can be um, in any combination. And this does not mean that people have certain um, preferences in one way or another. Uh, sometimes described as pansexual as well. Um, this also does not mean that someone is equally attracted to different genders, but basically someone can be sexually or romantically interested in people of any gender. And transgender is where we're pivoting away from the concept of sexual orientation and really talking about gender identity. Um, in the United States, there are about 1.4 million individuals who identify as transgender. That represents somewhere between 0.6 and 2.7% of our population. Transgender individuals are people whose sex that is assigned at birth is not congruent with their own gender identity. Um, and so these are individuals who, whose gender does not um, correspond with that which was assigned at birth and the cultural sort of identity of that gender. Important that we want to point out that we um, now use terms not, uh, I think often we'll read in the medical record that someone will put in a chart, a 30-year-old, um, MTF or FTM or something like that to represent male to female or female to male. Um, the terminology that we are embracing now is a 30-year-old male, AFAB, assigned female at birth. Um, and so that's what AFAB is, AMAB, assigned male at birth, um, and now gender identity is not consistent with that. Transmasculine and transfeminine are two terms that are becoming increasingly, um, are, are getting used more commonly now as well. Um, these are most commonly individuals who identify as transgender and um, are, uh, identify more on the masculine or the feminine side of the, of the scale. This can include non-binary individuals um, who do um, identify themselves more masculine or more feminine. Um, so these are also terms that are increasingly common. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Driver. Hi everyone, I'm Lachlan Driver from Mass General Brigham also, uh, and I use he, him, and they, them pronouns. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you guys about non-binary, uh, also known as NB, affectionately. Uh, we know that non-binary people are typically born with uh, bodies that fit the kind of typical definitions of male or female, but their gender identity is something that's, um, it can be a combination of both, not on the man-woman uh, spectrum at all, or uh, something else. 
Uh, we know that about, it's obviously challenging to study, but about 11% of LGBT identifying individuals also call themselves non, um, non-binary, and many of these also call themselves transgender. Uh, the majority, uh, three quarters, are in their late teens and 20s. And then uh, most of the time they use gender neutral pronouns, although not always, uh, so uh, they, them, um, versus the neo-pronouns, uh, Zizer, he, uh, he, her, um, and some use multiple terms. So another poll question, kind of food for thought, what does it mean for a transgender person to transition? Does it mean using pronouns or dressing to align with one's internal ge- uh, gender identity, taking hormones, pursuing gender affirmation surgery, any or all of the above? So. Uh, it's of course D, any of, and all of the above, and none of these are mandatory for somebody to be considered as a, you know, a valid trans, transgender person. T is also for transition. Uh, there's different aspects to transition. There's the social, where individuals can uh, choose, a, choose a name, a uh, style of dressing, um, use different pronouns. There's a hormonal aspect where uh, individuals take hormone replacement therapy, or HRT, which can be testosterone or estrogen, sometimes in combination with um, spironolactone. There's surgical transition. So top or bottom surgery, facial feminization surgery, tracheal shave surgery, or, um, and many others. And there's uh, one of the kind of elephants in the room sometimes is the frequency of detransitioning. So I found a really lovely paper on this um, where um, they actually found that statistically speaking, it's very, very um, infrequent for somebody to detransition. So about 13% of individuals who transition sometimes detransition, but the vast majority of these, over 80%, it's external driving factors, so social, family pressures, and not any kind of internal change with how the individual feels. Q is also for queer and questioning. So queer was a historically pejorative term, uh, now re-embraced by the community. Uh, And a common identity, um, individuals like it because it's a multifaceted word. It can mean sexually queer, uh, gender queer. It's uh, anyone who's not exclusively heterosexual, cisgender, can consider themselves to be queer. Questioning, it's the process of defining, redefining, exploring sexual orientation, and this is, uh, this can be a lifelong uh, process. And um, again, this can occur irrespective of whether somebody has come out, quote unquote, um, regarding their uh, gender or sexual identities. Finally, um, I is for intersex. Uh, So these individuals, it's, these individuals have anatomy or genes uh, that are not typically, um, they don't fit typical definitions of male or female. This is very different than being transgender. Most intersex people do identify as male, uh, as men or women, although some can also be transgender. Um, so this is related to biological sex. Not the same as being non-binary transgender, which are related to gender identity. And A is for asexual or aromantic. These um, asexual and or aromantic individuals uh, have um, little to, or to no sexual and or romantic interests respectively, but this doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have sex or have romantic relationships. And with that, back to All right, everyone, I'm back. I hope you're ready for me. Polyamory is what? A, having more than one wife or husband at a time, multiple romantic or sexual relationships considered a partnership living as a family unit, or C, someone who doesn't identify with a single fixed gender or has an unfixed gender identity. So I get the plus section. So plus is for all the other important letter designations that could fall under the umbrella, including, but not limited to, D, for demisexual. So demisexual, basically it's a French word meaning half. It's where you feel sexually attracted to a person after forming an emotional bond with them. You can be lesbian, gay, bisexual, pansexual, none of the above, or have any gender identity that you want. 
P is for polyamorous or ethically non-monogamous. So these individuals have multiple romantic and possibly sexual relationships, which are all considered partnerships. They live together as a family unit and they parent children together. So this focuses on more open communication and trust between all consenting parties involved in the relationship. And this isn't to be confused with polygamy. T is actually very important to me. It's for two-spirit. This is very important in my culture, Algonquin, is, which is underneath uh, Native American. So it's an indigenous term referring to someone whose gender identity encompasses the spirits of both masculine and feminine. So it can refer to sexual gender and or spirit identity. So it's been reappropriated recently uh, by those not part of the indigenous culture, and it's most common, more common than really perceived by a lot of Western cultures. Um, societies having three or more genders have been found in Thailand, in traditional Hindu culture, um, and then Mahu in Hawaiian and Pol Polynesian cultures as well. And then F finally is for fluid. This um encompasses gender and fluid, uh, sexual fluidity, excuse me, which can change daily, all right? We all have the ability to change our mind and change it again, and this is where fluid comes in. Uh, the Human Rights Campaign defines fluid as a person who does not identify with a six, uh, fi single fixed gender or has a fluid or unfixed gender identity. And I'll pass it along. Hi everyone, my name is Elaine Chang. I'm coming from uh, UCSF and I use she, her pronouns. Um, I just wanted to turn your attention now to something called an organ inventory, um, which has been built into some uh, electronic health records that we might have, uh, such as EPIC. And uh, an organ inventory essentially considers um, organs that a patient may or may not have and doesn't always have to include reproductive organs, but that's what we'll focus on today. And this can be a really critical part of the review of systems um, and alter the workup and management of our patients in the emergency department. So when might this be important? So uh, many presenting issues can potentially be related to medications, including hormones, um, surgery, uh, and also genitalia when we think about things like abdominal symptoms, um, GU symptoms, or even patients presenting with direct gender affirming care needs such as post-op complications, and you can see some of the examples on the slides. Um, additionally, there are certain things we do that are very routine and um, almost mundane sometimes in the emergency department, such as ordering urine or serum pregnancy tests, and thinking about an organ inventory can really help us ensure that we're performing these screening tools appropriately. So how do you ask and how do you conduct an organ inventory? Um, overall, the key is to be uh, try and be as open and non-judgmental as possible, um, to preface your questions on a need-to-know basis, um, and also routinely asking this of all your patients. And this part is especially important because um, I think even, even those of us who care very deeply about these causes, you, you might find yourselves not asking every single person the same questions. Um, just so trying to check yourself and making sure that you're not only screening people who, for some reason or other, you feel like you might not know their gender identity or aren't sure how someone presents, um, and to challenge your own biases and assumptions. Um, so some example questions you can ask. Um, as we talked about earlier, you can ask, were you assigned male or female at birth? What words do you use for your internal or external genitals? And if people don't understand, you can just say something like, people typically call an organ a penis or a vagina, and what do you use? And using those terms um, moving forward to make people more comfortable. You can ask specifically what surgeries have you had, um, top surgery, bottom surgery. There's a paper that uh, came out, I think in 2021, about um, post-op complications and defining the different types of um, uh, gender-affirming surgeries, um, and then and then being very specific and asking specifically, do you have a uterus? Do you um, have a cervix? For example, um, recognizing that uh, people who um, are cisgender, for example, might not have some of these um, organs as well. So that, that's just a very quick primer on um, an organ inventory. Hi everyone, I'm Dustin Williams. I'm from uh, UT Southwestern in Dallas and my pronouns are he and him. And I've got another question for you. How do you ask your patients about their sexual history? Do you A, ask them do they have sex with men, women, or both? Do you ask them B, to tell them about, tell you about their uh, sexual practices and partners? Or C, you don't ask, you wait for them to bring it up? 
And the sexual history can be a very personal and a potentially uncomfortable part of the history for a patient, but it's important for us as providers to understand this uh, to better ascertain what sort of risk our patients are experiencing. Uh, if you're in the audience and you're my age or older, you might have learned in medical school to ask the sexual history in, uh, in B, do you have, or A, do you have sex with men, women, or both? But I can tell you that uh, humans are really complex sexual creatures, and it's hard to fit all of us nice and neatly in all those um, three boxes, and we can be doing this better. So a few tips for obtaining sexual history. Make sure you sign post early. It's important that the information that we're ascertaining is relevant and pertinent to the presentation in the emergency department, and it helps clue in your patient on why this is important uh, and how this could potentially change their treatment or diagnostics. Um, give them some context on why this information is important, and also let them know that this is a routine part of uh, a medical history. Also ensure confidentiality. People are more likely to be open and honest if they know the conversation is going to be confidential. So it's my practice pattern to exclude everybody from the room while we're having these, uh, uh, these conversations, and it's the, the, the patient has to opt out for that. Also be clear, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Avoid assumptions. Assumptions related to age, um, sexual orientation, relationship status. Uh, you really can't read a book by its cover, so try to use more general terms instead of asking someone about their husband or wife. Use more general terms like spouse, significant other, or partner. Be sensitive. Many members from um, um, sex and gender minorities have experienced discrimination and homophobia related to their health care, so be sensitive to those issues. And make sure you practice your, your best poker face. Uh, you never know what patients are going to say, and you don't want you to have a surprise reaction that could be interpreted negative by your patient. So be ready for anything. And also be non-judgmental. Uh, the five Ps is a one method suggested for obtaining a sexual history, and that is partners, practices, protection, past history, pregnancy, and privacy. So asking your patients, uh, do you have one or more sexual partners? Uh, do they have other sexual partners? Do you engage in genital sex? And if you practice uh, insertive intercourse, do you use barrier protection? Sometimes, all the times. Do any of your partners produce sperm? But it really is crucial to be cognizant of the mental, emotional, and medical challenges that these patients face and understand the discussion of genitals and sex acts may be complicated by disassociation uh, with a patient's own body, and this can make the conversation particularly sensitive and stressful to the patient. As with all exams in the emergency department, they should be focused, pertinent, and relative, and that is specifically important for gender and sexual minority patients. They should be focused, relevant, and based on the patient's anatomy. You know, examining every system in every patient is probably not always indicated, but if it is, it helps to explain that to your patient and why that's important to their care. Additionally, there should always be someone in the room for the sensitive parts of the exam, like the genital exam, uh, but you also need to be cognizant on having a lot of observers and the patient feeling like we're having medical voyeurism. Uh, and then last but not least, providers should describe the steps that they plan to take during the exam and try to use the words that patient use to describe their genitals, and that always helps to have this conversation before the exam starts while the patient's clothes are on. Good morning, everybody. I'm Michelle Lal. I'm from Emory, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. So I'm up here. We're going to talk right now about implicit bias, right? So I do think there are probably a fair number of folks in the audience who are allies or want to be better allies, and this is where this information comes in. So poll question here, what are implicit biases? So are they intentional, expressed directly, consciously expressed, or do they operate subconsciously? So the answer there is D, right? Most implicit biases are unconscious. Many people don't recognize that they may be a perpetrator of implicit bias until it's pointed out to them. So kind of step number one is understanding what this means, right? So implicit bias, these are when our fast brain kicks in. So I'm not sure how many of you have kind of heard about fast brain, slow brain, right? So fast brain is our reactive brain. It's our brain that is fight or flight that has allowed us to perpetuate as a species um, and not be <laughs> eaten by other animals and things like that, right? It's fast, intuitive, but it's emotional. Now our slow brain is conscious and thoughtful, right? So that's a lot of what implicit bias training centers around is stopping, 
to let slow brain kick in, right? So step two is acknowledgement and awareness. So a lot of my career has been focused on equity and inequities in medicine, but my name is Michelle and I have bias. So step, a huge step in this is owning it. We all have it, whether you think you do or not, it's there, it's deeply ingrained. Many of your biases you probably had by the time you were three. So these, these go really, really far back. So how many of you have ever taken a project implicit test? Right, like they're fascinating. I have biases against things I would have never fathomed, um, including women in STEM. So I, gender equity is my, <laughs> my biggest part of my career, and I still prefer men in STEM fields when I take that project implicit test. So I think that goes to show kind of how deeply rooted some of these biases are and are deeply ingrained. So what does that mean? It means it's gonna take time to move on from those, or it takes the time to stop and let slow brain kick in. So there's been a lot of focus recently, as there should be, about microaggressions and frank transphobia against our trans patients and colleagues. So here are just a couple microaggressions that are often seen in healthcare. So what is your real name, right? It's just what is your name? What are your preferred pronouns? Pronouns aren't preferred, they are. Mine are, they're not my preferred pronouns, they are my pronouns. Using words like regular or normal, we kind of hear this a lot, that perpetuates heterosexual or cisgender culture. Showing intrusive curiosity. So this goes back to what Dr. Williams was just talking about. If the patient is here for a broken toe, none of this is relevant, right? So to be mindful about what you're asking and why. Focusing again on gender and sexuality when it has nothing to do with treatment expressing cis-normative assumptions or making assumptions about what somebody's goals are for transition. So if you've not had a lot of encounters with uh, patients who identify as transgender, the spectrum of transition, as Dr. Driver pointed out for us earlier, is broad. So you will see some people who transition in name and pronouns, some who transition just with hormones, some who transition with surgery, some who transition in many regards at once. But every patient has a different preference with where their journey is and where they want it to be. So it's not my place or your place as their physician to assume what their desires are there. And then expressing assumptions about trans narratives, right? I mean, I'm in my mid-40s, right? You grew up talking about cross-dressers and all these really derogative terms, right, that I'm sure many of you heard your parents, your grandparents, your aunts and uncles use when you were a child, right? And those, again, they're very deeply rooted in there. So you have to take ownership and know that some terms have been reclaimed by this community and some have not. So just be aware and, again, don't assume who someone dates. So, again, these are some that maybe aren't as directly related to our patient care, but what do the bathrooms look like in your hospitals? What do they look like in your office buildings? Are they all gender neutral? How far is it from the emergency department to the nearest gender, gender neutral locker room where you could change if your scrubs are soiled on shift? Right, so these are, these are healthcare level systems questions, but they apply to our patients too. Um, again, assuming pronouns, heterosexism, how long have you been with your husband? Use a more inclusive term. Partner is great. Spouse, significant other or we use a lot in our department, who is your support person that's here today, right? For those of you who are still junior, you probably haven't been burned yet by asking, oh, is that your dad? No, that's my husband, <laughs> right? So, the, I mean, it happens to like, right? It happens to everybody somewhere along the way. You make an assumption and then you've really put your foot in your mouth and have probably tainted the rest of the patient physician experience for that encounter. And then representation in posters, ads, and pamphlets. I think this is something that we can do in our own education, you know, things that are given to patients. What do the people look like in the brochures? Is everybody white? Is everybody cisgender? Is everybody heterosexual? So what do they look like? And that spans across other arenas as well, including race and ethnicity. So how do we, how do we move forward from this? And I think, you know, certainly when I talk about bias, this is what people want to know, right? Like, what do I do? How do I improve myself? So this is a great mnemonic, so implicit, right? So introspection. So just sit with yourself for a few minutes and own it. 
I mean, it's there. We all have it. Don't hide it and be shamed by it. Move forward from it. Learn and grow from it. Be mindful, right? And we, we're emergency physicians, right? We go, 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 go. And sometimes we are not mindful, right? You're like, hey, I thought I brought a granola bar to work today. Well, I forgot that I inhaled it two hours ago and I was not mindful when I ate it, so I've totally forgotten, right? So take the time, be mindful, take some perspective. So sometimes we are fortunate enough to have opportunities with patients where they can really share their story with you when you've quickly created that bond where they feel comfortable. And many, many of our patients want to teach us something about anything in their life. I've had patients teach me all sorts of things um, in my years as an emergency physician. So if you have opportunities like that, listen, hear their perspective, hear their point of view. Slow down, just slow down. Right? And we've all seen this happen. We've all done it. Many of us have probably been victims of something like this, where it's come out of someone's mouth and the whole room goes, oh my gosh, <laughs> they just really said that, right? So slow down. Individualization, right? So just remember, evaluate people based on their personal characteristics. This, again, goes against just making generalized assumptions. Check your messaging. Right, so over time, there have been many things that we've seen change in ways you would describe people, right? So um, one of the groups I'm in, we were recently talking about a letter of recommendation where somebody was described as putting her nose to the ground. So for those of us that are probably 40s and older, that tells me that she's very hardworking, very determined, you know, is really gonna get stuff done. Somebody who's younger than I was read it and said, that tells me she's no problem. She puts her head down and just won't cause any problems, won't make any waves, will do what you say. And I was like, wow. I would have never associated that, that messaging that way, but that's why it's important. Ask some other people, how does this sound? <laughs> is, is this how you would want to hear this or not? And then institutionalize fairness, right? This is about equity for everybody. So you have to sort of take your stand, make your fight for all, not just certain subsections. And then take two. So right, this is like your do-over, right? You're in this session now, you're learning about all these things. So take two when you leave here is to kind of practice cultural humility. It's to reframe yourself, your thinking, and just be mindful about all of it. And then flex is another one, very similar, a little bit shorter, but focus within, right, which again is mindfulness learn about others, so that's that perspective taking, see what it looks like through someone else's eyes, engage in dialogue. If we don't talk about these things, if we don't call it when we see it, then we don't move forward. And then expand the options. So I think, you know, many healthcare systems are working hard to do this, right, to allow patients to self-identify in many spaces, not just check a box. So just something else to think about. Brainstorm ideas, and then seek out diverse perspectives if you're gonna be part of a group that's working to make change like that at the larger scale. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Jen. Good morning, I'm Vic and Totten. She, her, hers are my pronouns. And um, I'm currently mostly retired. And I'm old. I look out here on the audience and I don't see very many white hairs. Now, I know that some of you may have them and are uh, covering them up in, with various cosmetic methods. But I challenge you, why do we have an EHR in the first place? We used to have um, handwritten records. When I look at my, I still have some records that my mother got from my pediatrician when I was a kid and an entire medical record for an encounter could have been two to three lines. She's three, gave her such and such vaccines, doing well. We, that wouldn't pass muster with our coders today. So how many of you could translate the following? Well, in those days, even in the emergency department when I started, we had about five lines, micro lines, to write the entire H&P uh, assessment and plan. And the whole ER record was one single page, usually with three or four uh, copies. Uh, with sometimes in the earlier days, it was carbon cop 
carbon pages between, and then later it was the write on and it would push through to the next level. Anyway, so how many people can parse out what WDWN, WL, uh, LOL in NAD, PMH, DM, HTN complains of? So that's well developed, well nourished, white female in, or little old lady in no acute distress, past medical history of di diabetes and hypertension, complains of. If that's not easily understandable to you, you probably weren't in medicine in the 60s or 70s. Electronic charts are more legible, transmissible, codable, um, but they suffer from, because you have so much more you have to say, there are macro stock phrases, and initially the EMRs, we just type them. I remember actually lugging a manual typewriter to work and being told that I shouldn't use a typewriter because the clacking disturbed the nursing staff. Um, macros are a lot faster than typing freehand, but charting has become, unfortunately, a whole lot more rote and templated, and those people that program these things are rarely practicing physicians. Healthcare, rem and of course, they're full of assumptions. You come in and you're asked, do you still have the same health insurance? They don't ask you, do you still have the same gender? They ask you about your name, but not because they wonder if you've changed it or go by a different one. They just want to find you. What's your birth date? I presume you haven't changed your birth date. That's something that isn't usually changed. Um, but do you, sometimes you have male, female, both, or you're just male or female, or intersex. What if none of the above? Sometimes we say prefer not to answer. Healthcare reminders. My family physician has a fairly nice EMR that automatically sends out to me, it has been four years since your last mammogram. Please call our office and schedule your next mammogram. I have them, the breasts that is, but it may be that I had had a bilateral mastectomy. They would still send me the, uh, the notice. If I had transitioned to male in the last four years, it would still send me the same notice. And if I have a patient in my practice who is uh, transgendered but still has a prostate, although uh, identifies and looks like and lives as a female, my EHR would not send out it's time for your PSA or digital rectal exam if anybody actually does those things for prostate exams anymore. So they're pretty rote. They don't often give you the option of updating such things that are felt to be fundamental, like gender, sexual identity, although you can change the name of your spouse. So, in one place I'm currently working, even though I'm retired, I, medicine is an addicting field, you know? So I still go and work about one week a month. So what if you can't order a CT scan of the abdomen without a pregnancy test? Unless the patient is over, I think it's 65 in that system or your only choices are menopausal, pregnant, or hysterectomy, and none of those are true. So I usually mark hysterectomy. Um, and carrying over instead of updating. One of my family members had some things that were incorrect on the initial H&P. Sometimes we hear what the patient says, sometimes we more or less hear what the patient says, and sometimes we hear what they don't say. This happens to all of us, and for the most part, it's not terribly important. But sometimes it is, and if that misinformation gets cut and carried throughout the entire hospital stay, it can sometimes have devastating consequences later in life. I'm not gonna go into details. Do you ever cut and paste from the previous record without checking to make sure that those details are still correct? Anyway, to, to sum up, before I pass this on to Dr. Moll, your EHR can be a big friend, but it has a lot of pitfalls, especially when it comes to gender identity and um, all of those things surrounding it. And I'm currently doing some teledoctoring. I always ask, is there somebody within earshot and may I continue to speak freely in front of that person? And I've been surprised how, how many people will answer, for example, a person that looks to me to be male uh, says, yes, my husband is sitting here, in which case I go on to say, if your husband wishes to be in the camera view, that's fine with me. Um, I also, when I do that, I have my office background and I have a rainbow flag, which 
is my way of signaling, you can talk to me about this and I'm not going to be shocked. And with no further ado and no more boring of my stories, I'm going to turn you over to Dr. Joel Moll. I think I have a hard task following Vigan. Uh, I do have a little gray hair, so there you go, uh, for whatever that's worth. Maybe white is true. Joel Mall, I'm from Virginia Commonwealth University. My pronouns are he and him. I'm going to talk a little bit about why education matters. So we spent a lot of time this morning talking about that, talking about different educational sound bites, educational theories, educational facts, I would like to think, and how we can use that to kind of better help us. And hopefully that's the reason you all are here. But you know, it matters because simply even though there's no specific you know, gay disease or LGBTQIA plus disease, uh, despite what some of the standardized tests try to imply, you know, this is something that is pretty ubiquitous in when, what you look like what we see in our patients. And we have multiple known and even more unknown healthcare disparities, which we don't have time to go in today, but it's something to learn, certainly. And identity can certainly be different than behavior. Um, and then finally, you know, on your next shift, you're very likely to see somebody who's an belongs or identifies somewhere in the LGBTQI plus community. ACGME, for those of us who are educators, also makes it clear, um, a little play on words for the clinical learning environment uh, review, that uh, social determinants of health, uh, of which being LGBTQIA plus, this is one of them, are important things to teach, and that's something that they want to make sure that we're doing. They ask our residents and our faculty that every year on our ACGME surveys, which lovely just came out. Um, even our 2019 EM model of the curriculum for emergency medicine has now listed for the first time uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, so that's a great move forward. Uh, more to come on that in a 2022 model. Um, and we know going into training as a medical student, there's a significant amount of both implicit and unfortunately some explicit bias in what heterosexual medical students you know, kind of bring with them, that baggage, what have you. I mean, again, most of this is unconscious, but it's important to realize that you know, education is a solution to some of these biases that we have, and so it's really important to include it. Similarly, in residents, in a 2019 study, you know, asking about are you comfortable working alongside emergency medicine physicians who happen to identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, you know, intersexual, asexual, what, questioning, whatever. Um, and also, do you feel that everybody who is in that community, who's queer basically, should, deserves to have the same health care as everybody? And the numbers look good, except when, when you think about five to six percent of people don't want to work with a gay physician or a trans physician. Five to six percent of residents don't feel that people who are LGBTQIA plus deserve the same health care as everyone else. Um, you know, that's bothersome to me because I will take care of anybody in the emerging department regardless. And so we still definitely still have some work to do. So education, again, is an important point to that. And we know in undergraduate medical education, and this was a little bit dated, 2011, kind of this landmark study that came out from Oberlin in that group that basically said, you know, maybe five hours of medical school curriculum based on LGBTQIA+. And that actually, in some medical schools, they get none, you know, about a third. So again, not a lot of education necessarily there. And then we said, well, what do we do in emergency medicine residency? So in 2013, we surveyed, and only 25%, and that was a pretty good survey response. It was like 67% of the programs at the time, which is almost impossible now, because I think we've tripled them or something since then. Uh, but anyway, that's another talk for another day. But the thing about it is, is you know, 25% for a median of zero hours, right? So we said, well, how are we doing a few years later? So we did a survey in 2020. Now we're up to 75% of programs, which is great, which means that 25% don't do anything, and the median hours are now two hours. Is that enough? What are people teaching? All topics for discussion. And then post-residency, despite going back into the 1980s for recommendations about having, you know, CME for physicians, because not a lot of attending physicians or providers are required to have any kind of training on basic aspect of it, like you all are having today. Um, but the only state that really has enacted this or done anything with that is California. Um, so again, provider care requires knowledge and understanding of LGBTQIA plus health. Um, education is inadequate at most levels of education, despite the requirements that are now coming down from the LCTMA and also from the ACGME. Societal context and intersectionality are really important. And then progress has occurred, but more education is desired by most learners. And with that, I'll pass it for the finale. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm back. Still Lachlan Driver, he, him, they, them. Um, 
So uh, as you would expect, I'm gonna ask if anyone has questions at the end. So um, I'd encourage you to start thinking about questions right around now. So to conclude, ultimately, Embracing and celebrating the diversity of the LGBTQIA plus acronym is a good thing. I know that some of the terms that we taught you today or discussed today, they're gonna to be outdated in, in between five and 10 years, and that's okay. That's, it, you know, that's kind of the whole point. This acronym continues to grow. And knowing this is ultimately a positive for patients, for physicians, uh, for healthcare in this country as a whole. So our goals, uh, and I think Dr. Mole put it, um, a lot more succinctly than I ever could, but it's so incredibly important that we get taught um, as med students, as residents, and of course as faculty on these topics because we wanna make sure that these topics are integrated into the medical school curriculum, into the residency curriculum, and of course faculty because it's so challenging to teach something that we're not familiar with. We want to decrease the micro and macro aggressions towards uh, LGBT patients and medical staff, as Dr. Um, Law was discussing. And we know that everyone makes mistakes. We want to be aware, open-minded, and willing to learn. That's the important part. We want to work to practice individually um, and in, in groups uh, to use pronouns. I know one of the one of the toughest things people say is using they them pronouns consistently, but it definitely takes a lot, of, it takes some practice, but um, that is something as, we, as emergency physicians, we need to take the time to learn how to do. It's important not to take corrections or mistakes personally, and not to dwell on the errors to the detriment of the other person. So for example, if I misgender somebody, I say, she, like she went to the store and be like, oh he, and then just being like, sorry he, and then, moving on because the worst thing is kind of dwelling at it, profusely apologizing, and then it, it, it's not great for anyone. Acknowledging our own biases. I'm Lachlan Driver and I'm biased. We never wanna shame or mock individuals who use the word, wrong terminology, who ask questions, or who seem lost. We're all here to learn. And as a specialty, we need to evolve together for the sake of inclusivity and understanding because working to understand the acronym to make ourselves better, to address our own biases will ultimately lead to better patient care and ultimately it's good for all of us. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. We have a couple minutes for questions. If anybody has any questions uh, for our speakers, we'll happily take them. Yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so uh, in one of the slides, it had mentioned something about uh, hormone replacement therapy and not assuming why it's being taken. Um, so as far as, like, um, can you explain other reasons that our patients might be taking hormone replacement therapy if it's not to transition to the, the other gender? It's because there's a spectrum? Is that, I'm sounding very ignorant, I'm sure, but I really want to understand more about this topic. The first thing that comes to my mind is like my grandfather, when he had prostate cancer, not only did he have a bilateral orchiectomy, uh, but he also was on, pros, on um, female hormones. I think that's a very important question, and I think um, just thinking about even the term hormone replacement therapy is now considered outdated because we, we assume women um, are taking hormone replacement therapy for menopause symptoms. It's not really replacing. It's um, and so I think when we're thinking about um, someone who's transitioning to an, another gender, it's gender conf uh, confirming or conforming um, hormone therapy. So I think just being careful with that particular term is important. Um, and I think people are on you know hormones for 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 many different reasons. Um, I know certain um, uh, cancers and uh, uh, different things like that. But I think that. Um, I don't think it's 
I personally don't think it's a bad thing to ask why they're taking it. Um, you know, I think if it's part of your conversation with them as a physician. Uh, but I just think thinking about that term HRT um, is, is important to realize when you're saying that. And of course, a hor um, pregnant, to take hormones from a pregnant mare isn't really replacing hormones that you normally had if you were female. Uh, pregnant mare's urine, uh, that would be Premarin. It's not bioidentical to humans. Thank you. We have about time for one or two more questions. Uh, perhaps this is uh, oversimplistic, but do you have any guidance on selecting your chaperone during this exam? Any of our speakers have any thoughts on that? On choosing a correct chaperone? Um, I, so I teach um, uh, pelvic exams to the interns when they come in, and one of the things I always say is make sure that uh, you have someone from your side of the camp that's on there. So, um, you know, there can be someone else there, but if it's their family member or their um, person, that's, that doesn't count. So I also um, teach that it's okay to have a male chaperone if you're doing a, a fe female pe pelvic exam. Like if you have a, the only person that's around is a, their nurse and it's a male, I have them come in, but they don't need to stand and directly stare at, you know, at, at the runway that I'm staring at. They can just stand in the room and be, and be there as a supporting uh, measure and someone that's um, uh, there to protect uh, yourself and the patient. So um, I, I, don't, I don't have to, I don't try to match a gender or a sex. I just make sure that someone from, um, from my team is, is in there with me. And just to build on that, um, I guess uh, I've always been taught to have, um, as, as you said, somebody else in the room regardless of their gender, but also uh, I know in the past sometimes we've done, if the, gen if the gender of the provider m matches the gender of the patient, uh, sometimes, you know, people didn't have chap chaperones. For me, it's, always, you know, regardless of anyone's gender, like always having a second person in the room, for sure. I think those are all great suggestions. Maybe even asking the patient if they have a preference on who the chaperone would be might be a good suggestion. Um, any other questions? Wonderful. Thank you guys so much for joining us. The first thing, Brian Early, uh, for our first day of SAM. Appreciate you.